Little efforts have chain event. That's what this Wallaby team. Down go there, oh. no way! Oh, Filippo, that is outrageous! Outrageous! He's got two, the flying Filippo. Down go Again, look at Filippo, he's really the only player chasing. Williams, the experience of Liam Williams and goes straight to Filippo, try number two for the winger. Silverware at long last, the Wallabies 36, Wales 28 and Australia flying high, two victories in a row, life under Joe Schmidt is soaring. Yes, yeah. last year's disaster under Eddie Jones, a distant memory. I'm Christy Doran. With me, Tony Harper, to run you through the Wallabies' second test victory against Wales here in Melbourne on Saturday evening. Harps, good to have you join us. Oh, it's great. I'm so stoked. That was 12 out of 10, that performance, Christy. Absolutely amazing. Uh, best thing I've ever seen. Silverware. Is rugby the only sport in the world where you can be the tin pot B team from some far-flung nation and you actually get to walk around with the trophy? It's hard like the Champions League or the World Cup, is it? No, it's not. But for a, for a nation that needs a bit of silverware, uh, the Rugby Australia offices at Moore Park will be all the happier, <laughs> um, as, as as will our listeners who uh, would be thrilled to know that you've given the Wallabies a 12 out of 10 performance. I know that there's a... <laughs> I know that there's a, a strong dose of sarcasm in that, but off the top, four tries apiece. The difference, though, being Filippo Dangunu and a couple of individual acts. Noel Olaseo with three penalties, Ben Donaldson to, uh, with one late in the second half too. So th that's the difference between the couple of sides tonight and an eight-point victory. So... You've got to say, first first of all, massive tick for Australia to be unbeaten in 2024 off the back of just winning two from nine matches in 2023. Well, let's just say, first off the bat, that it was actually an enjoyable match. I found last week's was a bit turgid. Uh, the quality was pretty low. But tonight had some pretty special moments in it. And you look at Filippo's moments in, in particular, and they were... They were great. They were excellent. They were, you know, what's going to get fans excited about this team. Um, you know, and I know I sound super positive. Last week I was accused of being the most negative man in Australian rugby. I actually think Joe Schmidt was the most negative man in Australian rugby tonight. <laughs> he he kind of, he wasn't he wasn't overwhelmed by how they did it again. Uh, Mike Cron at halftime as well. I'm not sure if you saw that because you were at the ground and he was talking about how they needed to come out. He was asked about their shocking hole defence that led to two tries there, and he came out and he said they needed to. Uh, there was a wee bit of technicality and bloody better attitude, which I thought really summed it up as well. The Kiwis are getting a bit grumpy at how the Aussies are performing, I think, Christy. Well, we don't know who's an Aussie and who's a Kiwi at the moment, but I'll continue with that because what Joe Schmidt said to Stan and then continued it into the press conference that I was just in was that I'm relieved... I'll definitely say that I'm relieved, but boy, are we going to have to be better. And I think that just nailed the first two weeks under Joe Schmidt. We saw a rolling moor once again on roller skates. We last last year there was the excuse of having a former halfback in Pierre Henri Bronken as the moor coach. Uh, this year, there's no excuses. There's actually proper rugby coaches that are. Uh, working alongside Joe Schmidt, but still the same old problems continue to uh, bring Australian down. And, and, and James Slipper actually identified that nicely too. Defensive more, discipline, and not playing rugby at the right ends of the park. And he said, there's three reasons for you about where we need to improve. So he was bang on. And, and, and in a nutshell, it's really easy to simplify it to that. But let's stick on the highs for a little bit longer. Down Guno, like the seventh minute is when you're first referring to, which is a coast to coast try. Noah Lolasio would have had his heart in the mouth because his pass across the face of goal wasn't especially <laughs> great. Tom Wright tried to make the most of it, almost slipped up. Somehow the ball gets shoveled over to Andrew Kellaway, who chips and chases, manages to get the ball, passes to Fraser McWright who runs 30 metres before putting on the chest of Filippo Downer Gunu to score. And 
in the early in the first 10 minutes that's exactly what a crowd needs to do to get up to feel like they're there and a part of a game well it seemed like it was a bit of a slippery start too obviously heavy rain in the lead up it eased off during that those opening stages but uh, you can't underrate what andrew Callaway did there that 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 was a magic bit of skill the way he took the step he was under intense pressure on a greasy surface he took a very calm composed step found the space to chip into and then he beat uh, Cameron Wynette for pace to that ball. Like the fullback should be cleaning that up from there. He got there, lovely little tap down to Fraser. Fraser's getting run down and uh, great backing up by, by Filippo. Um, I was more talking about his second one, but that one was a really a great way to start. And they raced out, Christy, to a 17-0 lead. Jake Gordon as well showing some nice skills. It was Wynette again who just absolutely... I got nowhere near Jake Gordon's box kick. Went straight through wide open arms. It was like, uh, you know, it was like some uh, four-year-old wicket keeper there, and he got hit hit in the midriff. It went straight to him. Jake with a nice little Euro-style soccer touch into space, and then picked it up and went away. What a smile he had when he went over seventeen nil after twenty-four minutes. You're thinking, yeah, weak Wales. We're we're on here. This is going to be a twelve out of ten performance. Um, but where, what, what happened from there, do you feel? Oh, look, you just have to think about discipline. And last week it was a really poor exit from Filippo Dangunu inside his 22-metre line that allowed Wales to get three pen, uh, penalties back-to-back -back and rolling moors. And then Fraser McWright got shown a, uh, a yellow card. Pretty similar on this occasion. You see Lucan Salakai Loto get shown a yellow card a really obvious decision to kick the touch and it just continues the pressure. Uh, the, the set piece wasn't perfect, particularly the line out. There was a couple of throws that were botched early on with Matt Fesler. But, yeah, you knew and, and, and it just looked like for the first 40 minutes, the only thing that Wales had was to kick to the touch line and try to go back to that set piece. And why wouldn't you? When, you, when it worked last week, it's going to continue again this week because there was no differences they quickly established that didn't they late two tries in 10 minutes and game was well and truly on uh in the balance there um fortuitous yeah also yeah so Chrissy also during that period Filippo came up with a try saver along with Jake Gordon he got uh the son of Ian both uh, the grandson of Ian both the both them Ian beefy both of them let me get that right and he smashed him across the boundary for a, for four runs into the boundary fence and saved that try. So so and then from that line out, Charlie Cale kind of went to sleep a little bit, um, and Plumtree got held up over the line. So there were definite warning signs there from that. Was that a case of the the greasy ball maybe in uh, Fessler's hand, or you know, is it, is it just a lack of concentration that that was causing issues there on both sides? Oh, probably a bit of an experience as well. You, you think about not just the inexperience from Fesla, who's uh, really well spoken, uh, played a lot of games over the last couple of years, but that's the extent of his professional rugby. Uh, I think decision making about throwing at the back is not always the right idea. You've just got to win the ball, and and if you don't necessarily have the world's best line out, win the ball, go to the front. Um, don't be so concerned about trying to find Jeremy Williams at the back of the line out because that's the hardest throw. It's going to put the most amount of pressure on. We just saw them struggle to execute there. And you know, the way that Wales started that second half as well with Liam Williams running onto that lovely ball, uh, scoring, there was a strong Welsh contingent from the south end, the south Yarra end of Amy Park. And they were up and about. It took... A little bit of smart, and Alan Alatoa crossing for her, his first uh, try for, to for Australia to get back into, and it's almost like every time that they took a step forward, then Wales just quickly responded, and that's a sign of a team that doesn't yet have the maturity in their game to be able to put a team to the sword. Uh, so, yeah, that that'll be something that when the review is run, they'll be thinking. How did we let slip a 17 nil lead? Because a good team should not be allowing someone like Wales, who's lost eight straight leading into this game, now nine straight, can't be allowing a side like that back into it. Let's talk about that Dung that special Dungunu moment, the second <laughs> one, because that is and, and Joe Schmidt spoke about that in the presser that 
sometimes it works once in 10 times, once in 20, probably more like once in 50. We saw it last week in South Africa with Cheslin Colby pulling off something equally special. But for Dangunu, who's played a lot at outside centre, who's been in and out of the Wallabies since he's making his debut in 2020, that is exactly what Joe Schmidt and Australian rugby fans want to see. Someone who is trying. He was the only bloke every single time that Wales was lining up for a shot at goals. He was the one bloke running out to try to put a bit of pressure on uh, the, the kicker. And that's from a place kick, let alone an effort to go for the touchline. To be able to read that, the timing of it was absolutely elite and fair play because he'd given away a couple of clumsy penalties the second straight week, taking someone in the air to make up with it with such in such spectacular fashion. Marvellous. Yeah. From, from I, I heard Jeff Parks in Warren Gatlin's press conference asking um, Gats about uh, Liam Williams's role in that try as well and whether he should have perhaps just let it go dead and, and – Played the safe move there, and so you've got to you've got to say that there's a fair bit of that to it as well. Like it is a, it's a it's a horrendous error from the Welsh winger at the same time. But you're correct. There was a great interview with Filippo after the game where he said he was really surprised that he'd been given two starts by Joe Schmidt. You know, he played against France I think a few years back, and then has been out of that side since then. And he had, wasn't really anywhere near the World Cup picture or. Or, or the team under Eddie, um, and Joe's obviously seen something in him and he's trying to repay that faith with that work rate, right, with that intensity that he brings to it, and that was a great moment that um, was absolutely the moment. His coach talked it up, loved it, and, and it's going to be one of those things that he can hold up now and show to the rest of them exactly what's needed in terms of those little, you know, what they call them, the one percenters that are going to get you tries out of nothing and get you... Uh, you know, um, field position out of nothing and actually make an impact where because they're going to need every single one. They're going to need 110 one percenters, Christy, when they come up against South Africa in a few weeks, right? Oh, you're not, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And and the game had another twist to turn when Rio Dyer just runs straight mm. over the top of, of Noah Lolaseo. Like, you, you might have been mistaken for it to being Jonah Lono. That's how he just <laughs> trampled over the top of him. Rio Dyer is not a big man at, at any stretch of the imagination. And for him to run over Noah, that's a little bit concerning. We know that he's not the biggest man. Um, Tom Liner equally pretty small too. But you would have hoped for him to be able to bring Dyer down. But it was a, it was a powerful, strong finish from a winger that – saw Wales once again close before uh, a, a, probably a, an ill-disciplined moment from Wales by giving away a really soft penalty from a clearing kick. Uh, it doesn't allow Tom Wright to have to come up with a decision about whether or not to put the ball into the air or run it back. As it turns out, he played on quickly. They probably missed out on on Don Guna getting a hat-trick if, if Luke Arn either went himself to draw the man or or gave the ball earlier, but in the end, Ben Donaldson puts the game beyond doubt by slotting over a penalty on the 22-metre line with just a few minutes remaining. I think there was a big moment as well around about the 58th minute where Wales had about 10 phases coming right up to the line. It was, um, you know, they were really putting pressure on. And at one point, they were back to 23-21. You know, it, was, it got super close when you consider the been out to 17 nil, and I think it was McWright and Valentini came up with a, a turnover penalty right on their own line, a really, really crucial one. And it was kind of at that point that I looked at it and I thought, Wales are out Australian Australia here. This is kind of exactly what Australia was like last season where they'd promised so much, they'd get back into games, they'd go really close, they'd get right up to the try line and then they'd do something and they'd be, be caught there and the other team, whoever that might be, was off the hook and away. And, you know, I think that I, I still think that it's great to have won two. It's great to have won a trophy that's named after, that looks like a hubcap. I, I, I'm not sure what that trophy, you, you know the name of the trophy. It's awesome to win silverware, 12 out of 10, Christy. But there were, the, the, you've got to keep it in perspective, right, with the opposition. 
Yeah, you absolutely do because it's not just that was a great play from Rob Valentini getting mm. on the ball, uh, physical beast against tonight, one of Australia's best. He, he might not have been the player of the match, but he was right up there. Uh, the other big moment was when Evan Lloyd, the replacement hooker, fails to find his second rower on the five meter line. Uh, with Wales, I think just five points adrift at that point in time, and you thought if if they if they catch that ball, another rolling more tries coming. At the very least, it, it locks the score up at I think twenty eight all. Kick to come, perhaps the the possibility of a yellow card. But for the second straight week, they led Australia off the hook, and that's the theme of my column uh, that will go up first thing in the morning, which is. The Wallabies getting out of jail, absolutely. But they're the sorts of little bits of luck that Australia haven't made the most of in recent years. They've had a fair bit of it in these opening two games. Joe Schmidt's had a fair bit of luck with how the calendar and the fixtures have uh, played out. The fact that Australia has managed to draw Wales in 2024 and not England and not uh, not not Ireland like was the case back in 2018 or perhaps even France who were taking on Argentina at the moment. Coming up against a really weakened Welsh side is the perfect runway for Joe Schmidt heading into a Lions series in 12 months' time, but also to get some confidence up before hosting the Springboks in a month's time at Suncorp Stadium. It's a huge step up. Before that, of course, Georgia next weekend, though. Who, by the way, just beat Japan. Just beating Japan, and that's great to see, isn't it? So, so uh, sets that one up nicely. And um, I just before I know you need to race back down to the media room uh, to interview a few players, but before that, uh, can you can you give us an idea of how you felt Noah went? It's always hard watching on TV to get a total picture of that. And you're right, there was like a the early kick that was charged down the, the pass to Tom Wright that was sloppy. Um, you know, number 10 being such a crucial role. He, he was under a massive spotlight last week. There was a lot of debate, pro and con, about him on the raw.com.au. How, how did he perform tonight? Did he silence some? Is there still doubts there? Oh, the jury st- is still out around Noah. The, the benefit is it's two wins. So whilst the side's winning, it was like the Aussie cricket team back a couple of decades ago. If you're still winning and a, and a, and a batter is struggling, you you can give them that bit of extra time to try to find them their form. At the moment, Noah is just just finding it a little bit tricky. But you think about the fortuitous tries that they got. That's not necessarily. There was a really nice one earlier on in the in the match, in the opening few minutes, in fact, when the ball went through the hands to the left in much the same way where Andrew Callaway released Tom Wright a week ago. Almost identical shape, lovely shape. He did that. Oh, you just want to see Noel or the stand up, command a test match, ensure that the side gets around the park. But it, it is difficult when you've got a, a rolling more and a set piece that's shaky. And it's all well and good saying be the master and commander at 10. Unless you've got a forward pack that allows you to do that, even Dan Carter is going to struggle at times on wet evenings to pull the trigger and always make the right calls. I think I'm curious to see whether or not he's given next week against Georgia as well. And I know I think he might because when you're trying to find the continuity, Schmidt only made, I think it was one change to the starting side this week for t- subtle tweaks on the bench. There was a little hamstring tightness to Tom Liner that allowed Ben Donaldson to come back. But if you're trying to allow... Uh, confidence and continuity into the team, you probably give your, your playmaker a bit more time in the saddle, perhaps more than others that might just get a bit of rest. Maybe Taniela Tupo next week against Georgia perhaps has, has a spell knowing that he's got a big month ahead of him. Uh, I'm totally speculating like a Taniela, but I think our changes will come elsewhere, not necessarily at 10. And as far as uh, on the flip side, um you know, who do you think – who who did did you think kind of failed to aim up tonight, if anyone? Do you think there were serious issues? I know Nick Nick White looked a bit exposed uh, when he came on and most particularly after the game when he was standing on the fence taking a selfie with some female fans in his dick stickers, in his uh, green and gold speedos. So um, 
I don't know if you've seen that, Christy, but it's it's worth seeking out. Oh, I don't necessarily know if that will be the judgment that Joe Schmidt's uh, taking into the selection table, but I didn't see it. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure others might have. Look, I think someone like a, a Liam Wright will probably come back into it. That might allow Charlie Kale to either rotate back to the bench or have a spell. Uh, Kale wasn't at his best. He's still got a couple of kilos you suggested to find over the next 12 months. I think the type fives where you've got to look at uh, in particular, maybe on as well, maybe an Angus Spice gets an opportunity at some point as well. Um, a couple of the subtle areas where, and I don't know if, if this came through or on t- quite a few issues with uh, taking high balls. Tom Ryan, quite a few balls to take in the same case last week as well. So absolutely not a polished performance. Still, you know, Phil War talks about there's many ways to bring up a century. And for this Wallaby side, that's very early into their uh, rebuild. That's a big one. I want to just quickly shift gears to the All Blacks, just to take a, a hot second to br- talk about them. Epic game. 2-0 against England. Scott Razor Robertson, congratulations, off and running. I just want to highlight Bowden Barrett. 33-year-old, spent another year up in Japan, In, in uh, comes back, hasn't played much rugby, and we've just seen the experience, the class of him to be able to come off the bench and lead New Zealand to a come-from-behind victory over England with a couple of amazing foots to change the momentum of the game fantastic performance from a world player of the year and world cup winner in 2015 two halves that was thrilling i was jumping up and down on the couch on that one um there was one moment where he kicked ahead and then he volleyed again and i was like use your head son head it forward you know and he reached out with his hand and he knocked it on that that robbed Robbed the world of one of the greatest of uh, all-time tries, unfortunately. But aside from that one little uh, glitch, it was, yeah, it was something special, wasn't it? And they're the moments where, you know, that's 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 rugby and what you love about it, what you, you know, that getting you off the seat, thrilling you that way. And, yeah, oh, it was a, and you're right, it completely changed the game. It was such a tight game until then. It could have gone either way. You thought England actually might, might nab that one. Um, and then you're thinking, you know, in look, in the end, they came close to a draw, right? They were banging on the door right at the finish. So they weren't that far off. But, yeah, absolute game changer. Uh, we're lucky to have him in the game, even even though he's a Kiwi. Even though he's a Kiwi. So 24-17 to the All Blacks. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, with Matt Tamura on Monday evening. That pod will go out Tuesday. James O'Connor think this time will be joining us uh, but lots to look forward to good to recap tonight's victory a successful one for the wallabies and you can find and read much much more about it on the raw.com.au thanks hearts thanks christy have a great night i'm going to upgrade my rating to 13 out of 10 after <laughs> the positivity of this podcast i will give it I'll give it another five to six out of ten, okay. uh, three out of five. I think so much to work on, but if as long as you're winning, that's a pass mark, and that's all you need at the moment is just little steps towards greatness. Okay, until then, thanks very much.